Live from Toronto, Canada, The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zuma Radio, AM 740. Merry Christmas, Kala Christuyuna, wishing you all great tidings of joy in this blessed holiday Christmas season. Welcome to the Audio Imaginarium. Come on in, weary traveler. Hang your cloak on a peg, grab a stool, and come gather around the fire. There are stories to be told, and you are among friends. Shelley Neese, author of The Copper Scroll Project, is standing by for the full two hours. She documents retired arson investigator Jim Barfield's fascinating journey to decode the most mysterious of the Dead Sea Scrolls. But before we get to Shelley, let me introduce the boys in the band. On the Flying V, Gibson guitar, my technical producer, Ian Robertson. You might want to check out his amazing rockabilly band at greasemarks.com. Anyway, he's one hell of a drummer. Uh, on the Rickenbacker bass guitar, my story producer, Albert Venzel. He can't actually play, he just likes to hold the instrument close and whisper into the fretboard. And finally, on the Hammond B3, Ryan, our live stream producer. Incidentally, there is no live stream tonight. We'll resume in 2019. The Copper Scroll Project tells the story of an Oklahoma arson investigator, Jim Barfield, who sets off on a decade-long quest to uncover Qumran's secrets, the lost treasures of the Jerusalem Temple, and show the world that the Dead Sea Scrolls were merely the tip of the archaeological iceberg. Through a series of breakthroughs and setbacks, Barfield's Copper Scroll Project became inadvertently tethered to Israel's modern battle for the Temple Mount. The Copper Scroll Project is the only remaining witness to a covert operation to rescue temple tithes and vessels before foreign invaders overran Jerusalem's city gates. Could secrets contained in the most enigmatic of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Copper Scroll, hold the keys to one of the greatest treasures in Israel's history? Shelley Neese is the Vice President of the Jerusalem Connection International, a nonprofit Christian organization based out of Washington, D.C. Her mission is to inform, educate, and activate support for Israel and the Jewish people. As a freelance columnist for several publications, her articles have appeared in the Jerusalem Post, Arutz Shiva, Front Page Magazine, and more. She has been present for the most central events in the Copper Scroll Project over the last decade, including the initial excavations at Qumran in 2009. Shelley Nice, welcome to The Conspiracy Show. How are you? Great. Thanks for having me, Richard. The Copper Scroll Project, an ancient secret fuels the battle for the Temple Mount. Let's set the table. Take us to the caves in Qumran, explain where they are, and let's talk a little bit also about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right. So the Copper Scroll is part of the Dead Sea Scroll Library. So it's one of the 900 manuscripts that make up the Dead Sea Scroll corpus. So, yeah, I'm not sure how much your listeners are aware of just the Dead Sea Scrolls story, but mm -hmm. that is a, just a fascinating fascinating story in and of itself. There were about 11 Dead Sea Scroll caves. The very first Dead Sea Scroll cave was found by Bedouin shepherds that were, you know, marching around the caves of Qumran, mostly just looking for sparse vegetation for their for their goats or sheep. It depends on which which version of the story that you hear. And and a Bedouin named Muhammad the Wolf, that was his nickname, he threw a rock into a cave, heard shattering shattering pottery, went home that night and sort of dreamed of coming back the next day with his cousins to find treasures, and instead found these scrolls that, to him, I mean, he was illiterate in Arabic, much less ancient, much less Hebrew, and so really was disappointed to, to find something that he thought was pretty pretty worthless. Brought it back to the camp. There was a little bit of debate in the in the Bedouin community that he was a part of, and the the tribe that he was a part of, of whether or not to repurpose the leather from the scrolls. Wow. Which, can you imagine? And um, and it took it took a few months before an uncle kind of comes onto the scene and says, "I think these are worth taking to Bethlehem on market day." I, I you know you kind of had a contact in the black market antiquities trade, brings them in, and it it was basically a cobbler who was also acting <laughs> acting had a side job of in the black market antiquities trade. His name was Kando. And so he kind of makes a deal that he'll he'll try and sell some of these. There was 
three squirrels in terms of for the first find, and he'll just sort of shop around and see if he can get anything for them. So for those very first three squirrels, the Bedouin went home the equivalent of about $60 wealthier once it was all said and done My and the word. deal has been done. My word. Right. And so, Such a crazy time to be alive during, and and really for the next, you know, it's just for the next decade, it's going to be a mad hunt between the Bedouins racing against the archaeologists in terms of who's going to find the next caves and who's going to find the where the rest of the library is hidden throughout the Dead Sea. Usually, it's going to be the Bedouin who win. That. At least in the terms of cave four, each cave in the Dead Sea Scroll, you know, they give each cave a number in terms of the order that it was found. For a long time, it's always been assumed to have been 11 caves. Just here, I'm sure you remember in the news that it was about two years ago that they found it was actually there was a 12th cave that just the archaeologists had never found. And um, it was in the case of cave three that it was actually a team from uh, sponsored by the Jordan Antiquities Authority that they had happened upon cave three and they were the ones that it was probably about 40 scrolls that were inside cave three. The problem was is that the the roof of the cave had collapsed in antiquity, co- crushing all of the jars. You know, there, there's like a very particular kind of Dead Sea Scroll jar that most people are familiar with from seeing it's really... Um, it has a bowl-shaped lid, and it's it's a cylinder jar. And so those had been crushed, leaving the scrolls in them pretty much exposed to the elements for 2,000 years. It took them about 10 days to excavate Cave 3. And, and pretty disappointingly, for once, at one time had several, several different um, scrolls, really had nothing left except for fragments of scrolls and rat's nest throughout the cave. But it was on the last day in the last few hours that they see this this wall that almost looks like a false wall to a lesser side cave inside. You know, always we talk about caves with the Dead Sea Scroll caves. It's really a lot more almost like cave complexes, you know, little side caves kind of within these nest of caves, multi-room caves, if you will. And so it was they chipped through it, and what they find is a man-made shelf, and resting on that man-made shelf are two copper rolls, and that's the copper scroll. Right. Now, just before we get to the copper scrolls, mm-hmm. let's just drill down a little bit on the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, just because it's for an sure. important um, context here. And for those you know not familiar, let's assume that people really, they've heard the term Dead Sea Scrolls, and they know that they... You know they they correspond with the biblical text and so forth, but they don't really know too much about them. So let's talk about what what the Dead Sea Scrolls contain and why they're important. Absolutely. Well, so uh, very few people would disagree with the Dead Sea Scrolls probably being the most important archaeological find in the 20th century, as much because it's the because of how it's associated with the Bible and because of the emotional attachment that we that we feel towards the Bible versus maybe King Tut's tomb or something. Um, and so just that alone, it would be amazing to find any peek into any ancient people group and, and their most sacred sacred text, except for that in this case, those are still the sacred texts that we embrace today or, you know, as Christians or Jews. And so... So that's why, I mean, just immediately the Dead Sea Scrolls, when the first one sort of came to the attention of the world, that they that they immediately just garnered attention and, and conspiracy. And um, it and it, it's a slow flood. So the Dead Sea Scrolls, the very first ones, when I was talking about Muhammad the Wolf and the Bedouin in the very first cave that was found, it was actually, it took, you know, it, at first, so it was about seven scrolls in that first cave. But what was most important was getting Jewish scholar eyes on these scrolls, because until someone could see the scrolls and know what they were reading or knew what they were seeing, I mean, they they were sort of useless other than just some sort of ancient un- unidentified text. And so, but this was during 1947, so Israel wasn't a state yet. In fact, the British were pulling out and and war, you know, war drums were beating. And it was um, 
a scholar at the Hebrew University, Eliezer Sukanik, and he had heard words sort of floating around that some ancient scrolls were on the black market, but he was able to make a contact and really, I mean, Jerusalem was divided by barbed wire and and it was not like a time that you wanted to be crossing over to the other side, sort of on the eve of war, but he had an opportunity to see one of the first of the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so he met his friend, he was an Armenian, and, and he was sort of like the one, um, the middleman in the deal. And they literally met on, on opposite sides of barbed wire in Jerusalem at a store in Bethlehem. And it was only in that moment that it was Eliezer Sukanik, a Jewish scholar, who sees a scroll fragment and realizes he immediately recognizes the Hebrew as similar to first century ossuaries, which are, you know, kind of bone coffins that were common to Jerusalem in the first century. And he'd seen inscriptions on those. And so he knew he knew that text and he could date it immediately, even through barbed wire, that he was looking at something that was from the first century. So once he was able to get his hands on all three of those first scrolls and he goes back to his apartment and he's, he's unrolling the scrolls and laying eyes on it the first time, it's just such a amazing sort of chill bump story because he, he realizes at that moment, he writes in his diary that night that he is laying eyes. He says that something like, I suddenly had the feeling that I was privileged by destiny to gaze upon a Hebrew scroll, which had not been read for more than 2,000 years. So that particular text that he had first seen was called Thanksgiving scroll. And, and really, it was a text that had been lost to us for 2,000 years. It's not even like it had made the biblical canon. or it. And so, right. um, and so he realizes that right away. He also had a copy of Isaiah. Um, he had a commentary on, um, it was a war scroll, or it's called the Royal War Scroll. So really, I mean, these were texts that, not just biblical texts, which would have been important by itself, but texts that no one had seen for 2,000 years. And right when he's doing that, I mean, as if you could just write this script, um, the United Nations chooses to it has their general assembly and they announce over the radio that they're voting in favor of the establishment of a Jewish state. How prophetic. So How prophetic. I know, he's seeing these scrolls, he's laying eyes on them for the first time and celebrations are breaking out in the streets around his house. All right, Shelley, I'm gonna, to, sorry, I got to sure. jump in here. We're going to take a time out. We'll come back and we'll continue on talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls and also the Copper Scrolls and the author of The Copper Scroll Project, Shelley Neese, my guest, right here on The Conspiracy Show. Don't go away. When you look at the sky, ever wonder if someone's looking back? This is The Conspiracy Show with Richard Sarrett from Zoomer Radio. We're back with author Shelley Neese, The Copper Scroll Project. We were talking about the, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, what is the significance? Okay, so so he, we, we have these scrolls and in Hebrew, some are in Aramaic, uh, and you know, we have uh, the, uh, we have passages from Isaiah, we have Psalms, we have other commentaries, the War Scroll, the, the, the Thanksgiving Scroll. Uh, but why, why are these so significant? What, what do they mean to us as, as Christians, as Jews? Right. So right out the gate, the most obvious thing is that we suddenly found ourselves like biblical scholarship was flipped on its head um, because the Dead Sea Scrolls predate the oldest known copies of the Hebrew Bible before that point by a thousand years. So before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, you know, the oldest Hebrew Bible that we had was about from a um, thousand CE. So suddenly, suddenly we find ourselves with Hebrew text. Every book of the Hebrew Bible is represented in the Dead Sea Scroll Library, apart from Esther, which is probably because the name of Yahweh isn't directly um, written in Esther. And so there's a possibility that what the Dead Sea Scrolls actually were were some sort of of Geniza, a sort of storage place for for anything that had God's holy name on it. But besides that, it's like 
what I see in the Dead Sea Scrolls is just this spiritual time capsule that we get to peer into first century Israel. And to me, just on a scholarly level, there's no period that's more important if you really want to deep dive into in terms of for Christians and Jews. I mean, this is the cradle that Christianity was birthed in. Um, this is sort of any messianic hope or expectation that was spreading among Israel. It was all in the temperature and the season of this in first century Israel. And that also applies to Judaism. I mean, really rabbinic Judaism as we know it today was also founded during this period. So for, for Jewish Christian history, but also just the world history, because the Hebrew Bible has affected the, the world all over, it, it really silenced the skeptics in terms of the Bible's authenticity because the biblical scrolls matched the, the traditional text that we had had. Right, and because so many people argue, oh, the Bible has way. been, the Bible has been, you know, mistranslated altered. and altered every, every generation when it's copied over and over and over, but not so. The Bible remains this cohesive, uh, consistent document throughout time. Totally, and so protected. And so there was suspicion that it had always been a very protected document. I mean, we could see that from the way Jewish scribes would so carefully um, copy text and, and, you know, were so meticulous about that process. But it was th this particular time in the 1950s, I mean, really biblical criticism is getting a lot of momentum. And that's what I love about archaeology, Richard, because it's something, it's it's a science that can immediately flip things on its head, you know. So scholarship and biblical criticism is, is starting to gain momentum after decades of really just kind of closely analyzing the Bible and trying to find any particular parts of Isaiah that may have been altered over the years. And then suddenly within a day, we find ourselves, you know, with this new text that's a thousand years older than anyone had could get their hands on and then and it just silences the critics and it flips scholarship on its head and really i can't think of anything else besides archaeology that has quite that same immediate impact true true um my wife was trained as an archaeologist i always say that's why she married me because she likes digging up old things <laughs> oh dear <laughs> but or she finds old things interesting there you go that's let's go with that one thank you <laughs> Uh, but it, it, I can't think of an example where where an archaeological discovery has disproven the Bible, uh, b because there was a time when when the existence of Pontius Pilate was disputed. Oh, that's just a fictional character, and then they found archaeological evidence. And I think the same for Caiaphas. Absolutely, and a uh, King David. I mean, yes. really, there was a lot of debate, and still is about well. There was a lot about debate about whether or not King David existed, and then we find the inscription in Tel Dan that refers to the House of David. Not only does it refer to the House of David, it also kind of hints at a Bible story that we were already familiar with and other other kind of international players in that. And so then the debate gets altered of, well, okay, well, King David existed, but maybe he wasn't as wealthy and, and maybe his kingdom wasn't as powerful as the Bible presents. But, you know, now we're digging up the the Palace of David right outside of the old city of Jerusalem and only, you know, re confirming all of this that we had always suspected of, oh, no, he's quite powerful and quite wealthy and had united the kingdom under his leadership. And so, no, absolutely not just from a textual perspective, which is what the Dead Sea Scrolls offer, but also just from the Bible stories, you know, that we're able to dig up Bible stories, especially with the rebirth of Israel and all of that being at the fingertips of, of Jewish scholars and people that know what they're doing and know what they're looking for. Um, and I think those chapters are still being revealed. I mean, what's even happened in the last 18 years is enormous. The Qumran Caves, the Qumran um, vicinity, the the Jewish settlement that existed there. Give me a give me an era. Are we talking about the 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 Hellenistic period? Or are we talking about um, uh, first Jewish Roman War period? When? Right. So there's the, there's one cistern in Qumran that dates back to to really the you know the the period of the prophets. I mean, dates back to to early 
Bronze Age, so it would say, let's say about 700 BCE. So we know that at least there was some kind of community there with some sort of at least engineering ingenuity that they were able to, to build a water source there and to start a community there. Um, and, and that applies to about three or four parts of Qumran that we know are old. Um, the rest of Qumran and the ruins that we can sort of see today d- do date to the Roman period, so date between the first century B.C. and then up until the first Jewish revolt, and so when the time of the destruction of the second temple. And and then, you know, then we'll not see any activity in Qumran for for 2,000 years, really. Um, and so, and we see there's there's Roman warheads that were found at Qumran, so we know that there was a battle that took place there. We can tell a lot of things about its its last phase of occupation. What we can't tell is anything about its why it was initially set up there. There are There is some theory that perhaps it was connected to the School of the Prophets in the Bible and to Samuel um, and that idea you know, David at one point hid in En Gedi and, and, and kind of crosses over a school of the prophets. So so there's some thinking of, like, possibly this could have been connected to the school of the prophets, especially since whatever Qumran was, it was treated as holy and sacred in its own respect, not on the level of Jerusalem, but Jerusalem throughout history will go through periods of corruption that the priesthood well, you know, we're just getting finished with Hanukkah. To, um, and so we know that the Maccabees, the people that were strong and courageous, will grow corrupt because, you know, the joke, when you re- mix religion and politics, you get politics. So that will happen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that will happen to the Maccabeans. And and so the, the Essenes, which Josephus tells us there was three groups that lived during this time in the first century Jerusalem period, and it was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. Most people think, most scholarship sort of points towards the Essenes being the ones who lived at Qumran. This was a pious, a, pi- a pious Jewish sect uh, that, well, tell us, Let's. this is a good top, time to talk a little uh-huh. bit about the Essenes. Uh, they wore the hair long, correct? So when I think about the Essenes, I mean, it's helpful when you're a Christian because, you know, these are, to me, I'm like, okay, so these were kind of a monks. You know, they had a monastic community there in Qumran. They wore white linen robes from what we know. And we know a ton about them because we have all of their text. We have, I mean, assuming that the Essenes were the ones who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls that were the scribes for the Dead Sea Scrolls. We have their sectarian texts, the texts that tell us their, about their daily lives, which is a really rare thing to have. Not often can you pair ruins with texts that match how the people lived on a day-to-day basis in that time period. So it's like a freeze frame. Um, they were uber religious. We also have lots of details about the way they lived from Josephus. I mean, not to get too deep in the weeds here, but, I mean, they, they didn't poop on Sabbath. Like, that's how religious <laughs> they were. <laughs> um, so these were people bearing control. They, um, they, they mikvahed, you know, so they participated in Jewish ritual baths way more than the average Jerusalemite. There's, you know, just the um, an amount of mikvahs, the amount of ritual baths that are in Qumran are on par with what would have been, you know, just within the holy precincts in Jerusalem. And so whatever they were doing there, they were they were pursuing a level of holiness that was on par with the priesthood in Jerusalem. Most people think that they didn't marry there's burial grounds outside of Qumran. Most of those inhabitants are men, although there are a few women. So, you know, we don't really know what that tells us. Like, were they just women that were en route to Jericho or, and they, they died somewhere along the route and they got buried there? But it's mostly men. Um, and, you know, they they believed they were living in the end times because of their other parts of their scrolls between the that there was this the war scroll it talks about the sons of light and the sons of darkness facing off against each other and so just like jeremiah talks about if you if you believe you're living in the end times if you believe that you know you're not as um pressed to marry <laughs> you're right. not that that's not your first priority well, some some have um, speculated uh shelley some mm-hmm. have speculated that that jesus was an essene what are your thoughts absolutely on that? Well, 
Jesus is harder. I mean, because he did spend so much time in, in, in Jerusalem and the Galilee, and we don't know, there is indication that Qumran was not the only Essene community, that there was also other Essene communities in different parts of Israel. And so if he, if Jesus was a scene, I think he was not part of the Qumran community. However, John the Baptist, I mean, that's, that, that is even a better match to me in terms of this, you know, both of them being rabbinic in their teaching styles but not married is unusual for if they had been Pharisee or Sadducee. You you know, you wouldn't really see that. So just the fact that they were choosing um, celibacy and choosing to not be part of, of that part of religious Jewish life does seem more Essene, but also just John the Baptist, you know, the way he talks about himself, the way that we envisualize just him making the way and and preparing the way for the Messiah, preparing the way for the coming Lord, that is a super Essene way of speaking. That was what they thought that they were doing, you know, so calling people to repentance, calling people for just to prepare their hearts and minds. Um, Also, John the Baptist walking around, you know, baptizing people. I mean, from what we can see from the architecture of of Qumran and also what the Essenes write in their scrolls, obviously purity and, and, you know, baptism is a form of the the ritual bath. So all of that to me, I mean, John the Baptist is a hard one for me to shake. He seems right. super Essene. And, and listen, is there... He seems above it all still. But. Is, is there a better John the Baptist than Michael York? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> we can right. have him play that part. <laughs> all right. We'll uh, take a time out. We'll come back with Shelley Nees, and we will get into the Copper Scrolls. We're just setting the table. This is important. Sure. We'll come back on The Conspiracy Show. Don't go away. The truth is not out there. It's right here. The Conspiracy Show with Richard Sarrett from Zoomer Radio. Curiosity, or did the devil make you do it? Whatever the reason, welcome back to The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zoomer Radio. We're back with Shelley Nee's The Copper Scroll Project. We're talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls. We're talking about their discovery in the, the caves of Qumran, uh, beginning in 1946-47, all the way up until 1956. Um, and uh, the um, we were discussing also the Essenes. Now, they were the they were the scribes. They were the 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 individuals that that this priestly sect that that uh, copied these scrolls. But where did they copy them from? Was this up until uh, uh, up until now? Was this sort of an oral tradition or? Where did they copy them from? Right. So, and this is another thing about archaeology. I mean, before, the Jewish community was a very literate community. And so how early their literacy began is a date that we move further and further back in history, the more that we learn and the more that we find. But pretty much the assumption is that by the time of the Babylonian exile, that that the scriptures were already had been written or were being written, um, and that what had been oral was now written down. So by the time that they were living in Qumran and assuming, you know, that they were occupying that space, what everything indicates during the Second Temple period, during a period of corruption, it's Herod's temple, you know, the priesthood is is corrupt at this point, and so they've re- withdrawn. They've put themselves in, electively probably in exile in Qumran, to live out what they refer to as the way. Now, what's interesting is that they never refer, none of the Dead Sea Scrolls refer to themselves as Essene. So we are assuming that it's Essenes writing these scrolls because we have other ancient historians who Ptolemy and Josephus, who who kind of geographically put a group of Essenes around Angeti, around the Dead Sea. And then we, you know, so we kind of are putting all these clues together. But I do feel like I should note to the listeners that it never says Essenes wrote this. You know, so in 900 scrolls, we never have the word Essene, that they refer to themselves that way. They refer to themselves as the way or the Yachad, kind of the community. Hmm. Um so that leaves the, the mind to wonder in a lot of ways. They also never, they'll talk about historical figures in the scrolls. 
And I find this just really interesting um, because they won't name them outright. Everyone has a pseudonym, so they'll say the wicked priest or the righteous one um, for their leader. Um, they'll refer to the Lion of Wrath in terms of it seems like the person who kind of kicked them out of Jerusalem and and they endured a period of persecution under. So really, for historians, this just gives a wide field of trying to pinpoint who are these figures in history that match these clues and the scrolls, which is really pretty amazing. And some people even think almost, you know, maybe... At different points in history, there's different people that filled those pseudonyms. Like, you can look at the book of Jeremiah, and you can find that, you know, Jeremiah could be the righteous one. The, the, there was, um, they have one person called the Man of Lies, and um, and the Wicked Priest, and, and the Line of So you could almost even, in the biblical books, find figures that would have fit, um, fit those sort of, like, cast calls for those different people. Right, but right. but it probably, you know, still, no matter how we kind of go about it and, and and suffer through the the fact that they didn't make it easy for us to sort of diagnose or determine which time period that they lived in and who they were, it does seem to be to be essence. Now the the um we have the you know, the, the Torah, uh mm-hmm. the Old Testament in there. The but is there anything in the, the commentaries uh, that um, might allude to the Messiah. Right. Well, so there are there's there's a there's a lot of interesting things about just messianism in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, the pulse of them in terms of the commentaries um, is is looking into what's happening in their day and reading kind of prophetic events into what they see playing out before them in their day. Um, and so to me, just it's it's almost more important just this messianic pulse that you can feel in the commentaries, in the sectarian text, kind of, you know, just all of the scrolls. 30% of the Dead Sea Scrolls are just straight biblical books as we know yes. them today. 30% are sectarian texts telling us about how they lived, and 30% are commentaries um, or just extra biblical books like the Book of Enoch and those other books that didn't make it into our canon but were very popular at the time. And so I can't say that any specific messianic figure bleeds through. They do have a teacher of righteousness, but more than anything, it's just you can feel the longing and the messianic hope that they've identified with as a community. Uh, and is, is it possible that, that some of those scrolls or all of those scrolls were spirited away to the, the caves uh, be, in order to preserve them from the destruction of the Second Temple in AD 70 by the Romans? Right. Well, so there's a hot debate. You're kind of, you're walking on hot coals now. So there, there's a very hot debate that at Dead Sea Scrolls scholars have, almost come into physical blows at Dead Sea Scroll conferences <laughs> about, because there's two camps in Dead Sea Scroll scholarship. There's the Essene camp, and there's the anti-Essene camp. <laughs> the Essene camp is the one who, you know, have mostly created the narrative the most early that Essenes wrote the scrolls, and, and that seems, and that's the majority and, and the most kind of, like, highly respected scholars. The other camp is the anti-Essene camp, and they claim that they've been silenced by <laughs> by the others. Um, and so at these these conferences, they really, it's a real point of contention because, yes, that does make sense. How did one community have so many scribes? It doesn't, you know, that would be 20 times more scribes than we knew to even exist in Jerusalem at the time, and all of a sudden that they're all living in Kerman. So one idea is that, Actually, what those 11 caves were housing around Qumran were from the Jerusalem Library. So only Jerusalem could have had 900-plus biblical scrolls. And and it was whenever the Sadducees, or the, when Sadducean priests or whomever, when they were on the run and the Romans were destroying the temple and all of this, you know, none of this happens just suddenly overnight. Like, there's an understanding of what's coming. There's time to possibly get some of their 
precious scrolls out of Jerusalem, and they don't think that they're going to be exiled for 2,000 years. They could possibly have thought, we're going to deposit these in these caves, and we're going to hop across to Egypt, or, you know, we're fleeing, um, and, and we'll come back and retrieve these sometime soon. Um, Shelly, sorry, knowing... pardon the interruption. Mm-hmm. i got to duck in here, Please. and we'll uh, take a time out. We'll pick up on the other side. Shelly Nees, the Copper Scroll Project, right here on The Conspiracy Show. My name is Richard Serrett. Don't go away. Loose lips sink ships, and sometimes corporations. The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zoomer Radio. Where there's smoke, there's The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zoomer Radio. We are back with Shelley Neese, author of The Copper Scroll Project, uh, and it reads like a piece of fiction, but it is not. It all happened. It's all true, and we will uh, uh, we'll get into that in uh, more detail in the second hour. Right now, we're sort of setting the table here, talking about uh, Qumran, the Qumran Caves, the, the, the most momentous discovery of the 20th century of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, beginning in 1946. 47, all the way up until 1956, and uh, we were talking before the break uh, about the possibility that the the scrolls were deposited there by uh, priests who were, were fleeing uh, as the Romans were destroying the Second Temple in AD 70, and as you say, this is a hotly contested idea. Um, it's almost, well, I think the, 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 the Shakespearean authorship question pales by comparison. Uh, so at least the stakes are higher yes absolutely um but i guess the question is why why are the stakes higher why is why is it such a big deal to think that perhaps the the uh this is part of the jerusalem library and the scrolls were moved to the qumran caves uh otherwise you know as you say there, there surely there couldn't have been that many scribes in this little jewish settlement in qumran so what's the big deal right. what's the big deal it's like in one area you think, well, that it does seem like an awfully high number of scribes in a small sectarian settlement. However, we did find more inkwells in this one particular settlement. Our archaeologists were able to uncover more inkwells in this one particular settlement than they've found, you know, in entire cities. Uh, there are desks and sort of these benches that are... Really, we don't see them in any other first century settlements or ruins, and they look like scribe tables. Um, And even just we know from Judaism in terms of text is what Jews have offered to the world, right? You know, so the Chinese have built a wall, the Greeks have built the Parthenon, the Egyptians have built the pyramids. And and so what the Jewish ancient world has offered is is their words. And so just how holy and how reverent they treat this process. So it would kind of also make sense that um, that they would treat this as, as that they would segregate themselves, that they would almost have like how they've had in the past, the school of prophets, that there might be this settlement of scribes. So all of it kind of does match what we know in terms of the way that Judaism worked then, the way it works now. Um, I guess mostly, though, this is scholarly, right? So scholars make a living off of, Freud calls it like the narcissism of small differences. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes. So you and I look at this debate, and I'm still kind of look at this debate with some just, you know, annoyance that, um, that they would just blow up at the option because to me either way either way it falls what's most important is the time period that they were produced and the fact that they verify the authenticity of the bible but i think it would change the way that we think about qumran because it would reduce the importance of qumran as an actual site and so 
and and you would have to explain well if Qumran if if the Dead Sea Scroll caves were actually just deposits from the Jerusalem Library. Then what was Qumran? Why did they have so many ritual baths? Why did they seem to at least, you know, have a lot of scribal activity? And that's that's where we really get tripped up in terms of the, the theories that have been offered of what Qumran might have been have all been um, have all been debunked, sort of one by one. There was an idea at a time that it maybe was a, a almost like a like a desert home for a wealthy Jerusalem family, so that it would have been some sort of villa. And they just based that the archaeologists who came up with that theory they there were a couple the Doncels and Belgian scholars, and they really didn't have much experience excavating inside of Israel. So I think that they were surprised by that it was really they didn't understand how um, the mosaics and, and the pottery and sort of the wealth that you would see in other first century villas had it been a villa. And really Qumran is very stark. You know, there's no mosaics, there's no decoration, there's no um, real sign that this was meant to be anything than for an austere community. Um, so that, that theory got kind of thrown away. There was another theory that it was a fortress, that it was a Judean military fortress. If so, because it does have a watchtower in it, and it seems like the watchtower is kind of pointing towards a strategic location on a major transit route. But it's built at the bottom of an overhanging cliff. It seems a really vulnerable location right. <laughs> if, if Qumran was meant to be no. you know, part of some sort of military fortress. The actual caves, are they in Jordanian territory? Or are they in the West Bank? Where are they? Right. So th- this is another hot-button issue. So it's Area C, which according to, not that the Oslo Accords are still, still really relevant, but let's pretend that they are. Area Israel is divided into area A, B, and C, and area C basically means that should a Palestinian state or should the peace process go forward tomorrow, that this could fall potentially in a future Palestinian state. It was under Jordanian authority until 1967, right. um, and then it became part of Israel. So, so really, Qumran was not, you know, was not an, on the on any Israeli tourist agendas, um, and wasn't part of the state of Israel until 1967. And um, and that's when really too there was just a lot of renovation and um, a lot of things that the Israelis did. Right, and the, the Oslo Accord. Point. This was the the, the peace accord. Uh, between, um, well, Bill Clinton sort of brokered this uh, with uh, Itzhak Rabin and, uh, and Shimon, ya- Perez. Shim- sorry, Shimon per- Perez and uh, Yasser Arafat, uh, in which it, it, it was essentially a, 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 the two-state solution, but then was rejected by the Palestinians, if I'm remembering correctly. Absolutely. And so sometimes still, you know, you will... People will get fussy if Israel doesn't adhere to what was um, declared areas A, B, and C in terms of like as if they've they've changed the tables a little bit for future negotiations. But those tables have been changed by by the other side as well. Well, yes, but, I mean the, the Palestinians have been offered, or well, I shouldn't say the Palestinians. But I should say the Arabs have been promised a two-state solution going back to what the 1930s, uh, five times right. I think by my count. And the, the offers only got better and harder to turn down, and you know, and yes, that we could get more judgy for for each one that they turned down. But so, but it really, in terms of for archaeology, though, by international standards, Qumran is disputed territory, and so anything that comes out of the ground at Qumran is a disputed artifact. Right. And I'm not saying that I agree with this. This is just according to international law. Sure. So. I don't think many people realize this, but Israel Antiquities Authority is in full control, or they they operate in Israel proper, you know, the parts of Israel that would be in the future, or, you know, the permanent Israeli state no matter what. Right. But Israel actually has a separate wing, a separate archaeological association for Judea Samaria, so for what would be considered the West Bank or any disputed parts of Israel, that's under a different that operates under a different rubric, which right. really is 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 more military. the The head 
person, the head civil administrator for that is it's technically a military role. So I always think just in my own imagination, that part of the Indiana Jones story, you know, where the Ark of the Covenant goes in a warehouse in a box, um, <laughs> that part is actually spot on. So if something technically is found in these areas, they do go in a military warehouse. They can sit on the desk of the scholar who or the archaeologist who found them. They can take their time publishing about them. But because they're a disputed artifact, they're technically supposed to go into a military warehouse. Fascinating. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. And the Temple Mount, uh, who has jurisdiction there, archaeologically speaking? So no one is allowed to dig at the Temple Mount. Whenever you hear of anything found inside of Jerusalem, it's always outside the city walls, like in the... There's a city of David that's kind of, or the Ophel, that's sort of down from the old city walls in Jerusalem. But technically, no one is allowed to excavate on the Temple Mount. I mean, that's how contentious the real estate is there. There was the one example of the Muslim law was trying to, um, that they cleared out just tons and tons of debris from what we would call Solomon's stables just underneath the Temple Mount, and they just dumped it. Um, it was sort of an archaeological nightmare, but now Israel's turned to that nightmare into a blessing. And so now that's one of the, the longest running sifting projects. So they're literally sifting through, you know, what the Arabs sort of like took out from underneath the Temple Mount just in terms of debris and trash, and they dumped it. But it turned out to be filled with um, historical treasures. Well, and anything that confirms the the existence of the temple at that location obviously would would cause, you know, huge huge problems between uh, Arabs and Jews because the uh, the Palestinian uh, Palestinians don't the, the authority at least does not believe that the temple existed there. Correct. Exactly. Exactly. Which is a new phenomenon. I mean, up until recently, I mean, up until really Arafat articulating that there's. We have plenty of text from Islamic pamphlets from, you know, for tourism in that time period, from old documents, from Muslims calling it Solomon's City. Um, and so this is really actually a new piece of the Palestinian narrative, starting with Arafat, the temple denial. But yes, that is the current sort of myth that's taken over the Palestinian story, is that there was never a Jewish temple on the Temple Mount. No historian, no scholar, no archaeologist would agree with that, even even if they were atheists. But um, there's just too much historical references to the temple. There's, I mean, there's still the retaining wall standing there. Yes, the yes. Temple Mount itself is the one that Herod renovated. So it's nonsense, but it's important. You can never discount something just because it's nonsense. I mean, it's propaganda, and propaganda has to be fought. All right, so... I think we've sufficiently set the table in terms of the Dead Sea Scrolls, and now it's time to move on to your book. There you go. The Copper Scroll Project. Um, and we, we mentioned, or you mentioned off the top, that uh, in addition to these um, sort of leather scrolls, we had these two copper scrolls that were also found uh, in the back. Uh, was it behind kind of a false wall? Mm-hmm. So let's go into a right. little, just be, as we come up to the top of the hour here, let's just spend a few minutes and talk to me about the condition of these copper scrolls and, and uh, then what they, what they contained. Right. So obviously the copper scroll is my favorite of all of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's the most enigmatic. I mean, really, those three categories that we talked about earlier in terms of all of the Dead Sea Scrolls either being biblical or commentaries or um, sectarian text, the Copper Scroll doesn't fit any of that. The Copper Scroll, first of all, it's on metal, so it's not papyrus or leather. There's no other ancient metal document ever been found in Israel. Really, in the ancient world, we have one other metal document that was found in, in Egypt in Ramses II's funerary. And so this is really an unusual, unusual scroll, just even materially. 
And when they first found the copper scroll, it was it was snapped in two. So it was, really, we say copper scroll is technically two scrolls, but it had snapped in two during antiquity whenever they were rolling it and hiding it in this cave. What were the dimensions, and, uh, Shelley, before we head into the break here? What were the dimensions so of the copper it's scroll? about a foot wide and over six feet long. My word. All right. Once you rolled it out. All right. More to the uh, more on the question of the copper scrolls on the other side, Shelley uh, stays with us for the full two hours as we continue to delve into the copper scroll project. Stay with us right here on the Conspiracy Show. Live from Toronto, Canada, Earth, the Conspiracy Show with Richard Sarrett on Zoomer Radio. Merry Christmas, everyone, and thanks for inviting me into your home. Long-haul truck, RV, camper, taxi, your parents' basement, your loft, that greasy spoon just off the interstate, and your cabin in the woods. And hello to everyone listening in on our flagship station here in Toronto, Zoomer Radio, AM 740, 96.7 FM. Those of you catching this broadcast on one of our affiliate stations across North America, and those of you who listen on the Conspiracy Show app or the Zoomer Radio app, Incidentally, the Conspiracy Show app uh, is no longer available through iTunes, uh, but it still works uh, if you have it, and some of the features may not run exactly as they were intended anymore, but we will relaunch uh, that at some point, and we'll probably put that behind a paywall and charge a minimum amount, uh, but, but it's a great app. Uh, hi to all of you who listen and watch on our YouTube channel, Strange Planet. Again, the YouTube channel is now called Strange Planet. Please get on up and check it out. Uh, this program and my podcasts, uh, Conspiracy Unlimited, The Rock and Roll Twilight Zone, are also available there. Hi to everyone who joins us in the live chat on YouTube as well. However, and wherever you're listening and watching, I bid thee the warmest of welcomes, and I thank you for your fine company. Shelley Neese, uh, the author of The Copper Scroll Project, stays with us. Shelley is the Vice President of the Jerusalem Connection International a non-profit Christian organization based out of Washington, D.C. TJCI's mission is to inform, educate, and activate support for Israel and the Jewish people. As a freelance columnist for several publications, her articles have appeared in the Jerusalem Post, Arutz Shiva, Front Page Magazine, and more. Shelley has been present for the most central events in the Copper School Project over the last decade, including the initial excavation at Qumran in 2009. She's the author of The Copper Scroll Project, An Ancient Secret Fuels the Battle for the Temple Mount. And we're discussing the copper scroll discovered in the Qumran Caves alongside of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the copper scroll appears to be a treasure map which may lead to the unimaginable riches of Jerusalem's temple and even the Ark of the Covenant. Shelley Nice, welcome back to Hour 2 of The Conspiracy Show. Thanks for hanging out for the full two hours, by the way. And uh, I, I think it was important to, to, to spend that first hour sort of setting the table uh, in terms of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Qumran Caves and the Essenes and so forth. So now we're talking about the actual copper scrolls and you described them, uh, how they were found in, in sort of two pieces or the, the copper scroll was found in two pieces. Um, and as you say, the material, very, very unique. So obviously this is something quite separate from uh, you know the other the, the other scrolls which were on parchment, um, and the language is very different. I mean, it's 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 not you know poetic. It's not it's not prose. It's it's it reads like kind of an inventory. Exactly. I mean, there's sort of something I think about a lot of times is that for most of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the language and the vocabulary used in them. It's it's biblical, right? So we can we have a very rich Hebrew vocabulary in terms of if you were to describe the throne of God um, and the the angels surrounding it. But we have a very limited Hebrew vocabulary. At least we did before the rebirth of Hebrew. If I needed to tell you in Hebrew how to dig a ditch, you know, <laughs> so right, any sort right. of practical, non-biblical Hebrew. And that's the thing: the Copper Scroll had words that people hadn't seen because these were words that were just very practical, dry, um, non-biblical. And so, so 
I think for a long time people didn't even know what to do with the Copper Scroll and its contents because it is just this this inventory and this list. And um, but I should back up. So the Copper Scroll it actually took three years to open the Copper Scroll. So after that moment in 1952, and it was one of the few um, caves in the around the Dead Sea Scroll of all the Dead Sea Scroll caves that had been found by a legitimate archaeological team. Um, and it was sponsored by the Jordanian Department of Antiquities, which is important because the Copper Scroll today is not with the rest of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's actually in Jordan. It's in Amman, Jordan, so it's not sitting in Jerusalem with the rest of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and so it sat in Amman, Jordan for three years, and the problem was is that it crumbled to the slightest touch. So scholars could look at the Copper Scroll and they could see words protruding from, you know, from the outermost layer and they could see words like gold and silver, but they didn't know how to open it. Without and without destroying it. Absolutely. I mean, even when you just touch the edge, it would crumble because it did what copper does and it oxidized and it was green and it was brittle. In a way, copper was the perfect perfect sort of material choice for these scribes 2,000 years ago because copper has a way of preserving itself, you know, with the green patina, just like the Statue of Liberty. So, um, so if they could just unroll it, they knew that they would be able to see the text as it was written 2,000 years ago. But the problem was was figuring out how to do that and, and finding also um, someone who had the guts to to take that chance. They talked with someone at Johns Hopkins University, a metallurgist there who didn't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. And um, so there was this one editor on the Dead Sea Scroll publication team. Back then there was no Jewish scholars allowed on the publication team. The, the team was kind of organized and orchestrated by Jordan. And so they were really limited in terms of the expertise available in the world. But, his name was John Allegro. He was probably one of the nuttiest of all of the Dead Sea Scrolls kind of early scholars, but he really championed the Copper Scroll. I think a lot of them were just overwhelmed with the workload. There was really too few Dead Sea Scroll scholars, and this was the time in the 50s that the black market was just being flooded. I mean, they were getting fragments that they had to put together like puzzle pieces and and then real whole scrolls that they were translating so i think partially they were just overwhelmed with their own workload and it really just took one person who couldn't get the copper scroll out of their head and john allegro took it to manchester university and really was just knocking on on doors that was where he was a an alumni from and, and he was just looking for anyone that could potentially open the scroll he he found he found what he was looking for, which was a gutsy believer. Um, Henry Wright Baker was his name, and he was actually just part of the College of Engineering. But he came up with a very, what would look to us today, a very crude contraption. He borrowed materials from the School of Dentistry, some old retired World War II materials, and came up with... Um, a saw and a spindle and a vacuum, <laughs> and he cut it open. A real Mag just, a MacGyver before totally, his time. Totally. That night, he, he had made plans. You know, they 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 made the contraption. John Allegro tells Henry Wright Baker, "I'll meet you back here in the morning, and we'll make the first cut." And at that point, they still didn't know. I mean. The, the spindle did a thing where it would kind of jump on the table every few seconds. So they really still didn't know. Oh, word. Like one wrong. mistake and it's lost forever. Lost forever. And no pressure. No the, pressure. The, the only words they can see are gold and silver. So they know that what <laughs> is in there is important. But he, they make a plan to meet back the next morning. But Henry Wright Baker records in his diary that he made the first cut that night because had he shattered it, he wanted to be alone in his mm. misery. Mm -hmm. So the next morning, John Allegro comes back, and and, and, and they it, and it's almost already done. The job is already done. But they cut it. They weren't able to unroll it. Maybe today we could have figured out a way to unroll it. But they actually cut it into 23 strips. So we lost very little in terms of the content or the lettering in that process. They were pretty thin strips. Um, and so... 
almost immediately John Allegro is able to read the contents of the Copper Scroll. It's written out in 12 columns. It's over 60 locations. And one item at a time or one described location at a time, he's realizing that every single one says where to go, how deep to dig, and what is buried. So it's a verbal treasure map. A treasure map. Not a laundry list, not you know some some uh, someone one of the Essenes being sent to the Quickie Mart with a list of groceries, a bag, a quart of milk. Right. This is where to find the gold and the silver and and what else? Not just gold well, and, and silver. No, because it's using words like holy or vessels or sacred. Um, the total amount of treasure listed out in the Copper Scroll. There's debate about this because. It uses talents as in terms of measuring, or at least it does, and, and we think. And and so if a talent then meant what we think a talent meant, which is probably the equivalent of 70 pounds, um, that it would be about 160 tons of gold, silver, and bronze. Dear so, Lord. So that seems just too copious. So even if it was half that, even if a talent, you know, is, is half of what we anticipated it being, it's still, you know, no matter how you slice it, that it really, it's um, sort of a ridiculous amount of treasure. And so really the only place, besides the fact that it does have descriptive adjectives like, you know, holy and sacred and tithe, um, that point to the temple, we also just know that the only place in Jerusalem or the only place in Israel that would have had access to such great wealth would have been the temple. So we're talking about King Solomon. The... Well, there's debate about that as well, but it's it technically dates to the time period. I mean, most scholars think that the Copper School dates to the, to the Second Temple oh, the period. Second Temple. Mm-hmm. But is it... But, it... This is still tricky. I mean, it could. <laughs> there's ways you can slice it that it could have been Solomon's temple, but in terms of it's it's Masoretic Hebrew, or that's the thought. And so, if if the the Hebrew of the day matches the treasure that it's pointing to, then it would have been Second Temple period. So it would have been pre-Romans destroying the Second Temple. So the idea then is that the uh, in be, before the the Second Temple is destroyed. Presumably that treasure is taken somewhere. Uh, its location, it's buried. Its location is hammered out on this copper scroll. And then the copper scroll... Now, this is interesting because this gets back mm-hmm. to the question of the, uh, you know, where did the, the Dead Sea Scrolls come from? Did they come from the Jerusalem, Jerusalem Library or were they, were they written by scribes in, in uh, Qumran? If the, if the treasure points to the temple, which is in Jerusalem, wouldn't the map have originated in Jerusalem, and therefore isn't it possible all the Dead Sea Scrolls originated in Jerusalem? Exactly. So there are people, so you've, you're, you're connecting these dots and peeling back the onion. So there are people that do look at the Copper Scroll, um, you know, people that, that are on the non-Essene side of this debate and believe that they all originated in Jerusalem, and they see the Copper Scroll as evidence for that, like some of their best evidence for that. Now, there's another way that you could look at it. There is some idea that Qumran was actually, and and the Dead Sea Scroll Caves were Geniza. You know, Geniza is is a a Jewish repository unit for anything that has the name of Yahweh on it. It can't be thrown away. So, we you know, we found this in Cairo, one of the richest... um, centuries long Geniza is famous as in, was in Cairo and it's just this idea that if it has the holy name of God on it that it can't be thrown away and so you just safely put it in a repository or some sort of deposit system and we know that Jews have had a long practice of doing this but it doesn't and so there's a possibility or a theory that Qumran was actually a Geniza and because every scroll that that we've found or been able to translate and recover had the name of Yahweh in it. And um, 
also that would also apply potentially to the items listed listed in the copper scroll because we know that anytime we know this from extra biblical sources Jewish sources but that if a priestly vestment for example if it was um, damaged in any way that it couldn't be thrown away, that it had to be put in some sort of Geniza or some sort of repository. All right. I got to jump uh, in again, Shelley. Got to take sure. a quick time out. We'll come back to the Copper Scroll, this treasure map. Back with more of my conversation with Shelley Neese right here on The Conspiracy Show. Don't go away. When you look at the sky, ever wonder if someone's looking back? This is The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zoomer Radio. We are back with Shelley Neese. The Copper Scroll Project is the book. And before we proceed any further, how do we get a copy of this? Sure. Well, it's available anywhere you buy books, including just all the on- online Amazon, Target, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, those kind of things. The Copper Scroll Project. All right. So mm-hmm. uh, we were talking about um, the, uh, the fact that the Copper Scroll is a treasure map pointing to tons and tons, tens of tons of gold and silver, uh, possibly uh, pointing to the the second temple, which was destroyed by the Romans A.D. 70. But some say it could even you could maybe connect the dots all the way back to Solomon's temple. Uh, we're all familiar with the riches of Solomon's temple, um, and we were also you know wondering whether the the fact that the the, the copper scroll points to this this treasure uh, in Jerusalem might mean that all of the Dead Sea Scrolls came from Jerusalem. Um, and then we were also discussing the, the fact that because everything contained in those scrolls or in, in those in those vessels um, has Yahweh written on it. And so you can't throw that out. So Qumran, the other theory is, becomes this repository for, for everything that has, has uh, Yahweh written on it, which also goes back to your point earlier about the one book of the Old Testament that's not contained is Esther because it doesn't have Yahweh in that book. Exactly. So again, that, I don't know. All clues. Yeah, It's absolutely. all clues that, and it just makes sense too in terms of what we know about Jewish history and the way that holy vessels and scrolls were treated. The other option though is that You know, if this was a period, we have lots of sort of like biblical clues that any time of period of of corruption in the priesthood or just um, by foreign oppressors in Jerusalem, that at least in the case of Josiah, that it seems to be that they would take things out of the temple or the most holy of the temple furniture, at least that, you know, that almost like that there were safety deposits for these things. Anytime that um, Holy Temple treasure or Holy Temple furniture might have been threatened, either from the outside, from sort of a Roman or a foreign occupier, but also just from the inside, if the Israelite king at the time was corrupt or um, or evil or um, and so all of this either either way whatever the Copper Scrolls origin story there most of th- that's all applies to the Second Temple period I will say that all of the oral traditions for for a temple rescue operation point to first temple period so that we don't really have many of those oral traditions that, you know, that there was a covert rescue operation to get things out of the temple in time before the Romans destroyed the temple. But there's plenty of examples of that about the first temple. I mean, the most obvious being in second Maccabees, the story of Jeremiah secreting things out of the temple and hiding it on his way to Mount Nebo. But there's also a Kabbalistic document from um, from that we know from about 16th century Amsterdam that was found called Treatise of the Temple Vessels, and it's also this this description of a a covert operation where priests secret things out of the temple before the Babylonians destroy the temple. So, you know, so all of these, if you kind of just connect them all, something happened at some time where at least pre priests that were were concerned about the holy temple furniture holy temple vessels had a system and a way to get them out before they were threatened okay so the million dollar question the 64 million dollar question mm-hmm. what about the ark 
of the covenant. Is that mentioned in the Copper Scroll? So that's a great question, and it depends on the translation. It never... Now, remember, like we said, with all of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they never give us the helpful, you know, just directly naming a historical figure or their name or their authorship. They will always make this difficult. So, no, the Copper Scroll never directly says Ark of the Covenant. However, according to one popular translation of the Copper Scroll, um, it refers to Cavern of the Shekhinah, um, which that is, you know, the the word for God's holy presence that rests upon the Ark. Um, And this particular hiding spot is identified potentially with um, a collapsed cave or a cave much like the caves around the Dead Sea. So, so a cave hiding the Ark of the Covenant, to me, that one line, Cavern of the Shekhinah, see, it, it seems like it could potentially fit. Um, also, in terms of the Ark of the Covenant still being out there and not being destroyed, you know, there is a long Jewish tradition that despite the temple being destroyed and, and Jews have a day that they mourn the loss of the temple every year, there's no day that they mourn the loss of the Ark of the Covenant. Like, the Ark of the Covenant is believed to be hidden and to be only recoverable in the, in the age of the Messiah. Right, and only by or, a Levite, correct? Exactly, and according to Jeremiah, or to Second Maccabees, when Jeremiah hides it, he says, you know, this will not be found until the age of mercy comes. And so, anytime we talk about the Ark of the Covenant or any of the traditions surrounding it, it's that it's it's hidden, it's not forever lost, um, but that it can only be returned kind of during for the next age. So um, the, the the investigator Allegro, who had taken mm-hmm. he first of all the fact that he was allowed to take the copper scrolls back to the United States uh, does that speak well, more to the fact that the Jordanians didn't think it was really important? Well, he, yeah, he took it to Manchester University, so he took it to England. Oh, I'm sorry, he England. English himself. Still. No, but you're right. He did contact John Hopkins to see if they they didn't want to they didn't want to even touch it, so he didn't fly to Hopkins with it. But it was in England, and so yeah, I mean, I think there was just a lot of distraction with all of the things on the black market at the time, and this is this is the golden age of Israeli archaeology. You know, Mossad is about to be um, excavated. Um, and so lots of things are happening. So they did completely dismiss the importance of the Copper Scroll, though, almost immediately of, after it was opened, not just by Jordan or Israel, but also internationally. The New York Times ran an article almost immediately after it was open, dismissing it as as just they talk about that it looks like it was something that was written in the light of the moon and blood on Treasure Island, you know, just so immediately sort of putting it in the category of myth and legend, and not even talking about the fact that the Copper Scroll has no myth and no legend. There's no figures in it, you know, there's no hero, there's no narrative, um, which is why all Dead Sea Scroll scholars, they don't agree on anything. But the one thing that they do agree on is that the Copper Scroll had to be an authentic document because it doesn't have any value otherwise. Um, It's not like it's propping up an ancient legend. I mean, it doesn't even have um, any characters in it. It's written very dryly. It's written on experience. Expensive material. It would have, you know, been costly for them to inscribe this on copper. Oh, and this is really interesting. It's actually very poor handwriting as well. Um, if you if you look at it, and you can see this online too, but if you look at a transcription or a facsimile of the copper scroll, it looks like the handwriting is hurried. It's definitely unskilled. It even looks like there's several different people, probably about five different handwritings on it and the words get squished together and they make very kind of elementary scribal mistakes for for even like a first grader in Israel could sort of identify certain mistakes that they make and using um, Hebrew words that or Hebrew letters that should just be at the end of a word in a certain way they'll put it in the middle which, which um, raises some suspicion how do we know that this is the real McCoy that it's not a hoax so the, to, what actually, for a lot of scholars, the poor quality of the penmanship almost 
is another indicator for its authenticity because this was something it looks like that they were it was like a note to self you know for these priests or these unprofessional scribes that they were saying they weren't doing this so that they could display it in the temple or display it in a home that this was something that they chose metal so that it would sort of like survive the test of time and also um it was a note to self so you know go in like the copper scroll reads like go in Matthew's courtyard and buried in the peristyle is you know 17 talents of silver go in the stairs facing east that measure 40 cubits long and find you know a chest full of treasure so it'll kind of just go like that for 60 different locations and so the fact some people have even thought one theory is that they actually gave the task of of chiseling out um, the locations on the copper to an illiterate person so that they wouldn't be able to go back and find the treasure. (laughs) Fascinating. Oh, fascinating. So they didn't really know, they didn't know what they were transcribing because they couldn't read. Uh, So that's another sort of a security measure. Brilliant, brilliant. Very possible. So 60 different locations, this this treasure is spread out. Uh, Did Allegro, when he, when he, well, he didn't unscroll it, but when he when, right. he, when translated he, it, when he translated it, what I mean, did he jot it down on a, on a, a notepad? Did he keep it somewhere? What what happened to the translation? And did Allegro set out to find the treasure himself? So great question. He originally, you know, there's a lot of ownership and possessive issues over each Dead Sea Scroll and who got to translate it and who got to publish it. I mean, you know, not anything that's foreign to academia today either. Technically, the Copper Scroll was not his to publish. It was another Dead Sea Scroll editor named Millick. And so even though John Allegro was the first to lay his eyes on it and the first to translate it, he was a pretty quick worker, too. Um, not probably by most standards, not as good as some of his other colleagues, but he was quick and, and good enough because the Copper Scrolls actually, you know, was fairly straightforward for him to translate. And so he fires off a letter to his to his boss and says, these scrolls are red hot. We've got to start digging. You know, he's the champion of the Copper Scroll. Um, but by sort of the the you know the ethics of the Dead Sea Scroll editor team he had to wait for his other colleague who technically the Copper Scroll was under his um you know under his rubric in terms of what he got to publish he had to wait for that one and he took years so really the Copper Scroll translation and the excitement about it almost fizzled out just because of this kind of like scholarly bureaucracy um, and, and, and possession and ownership. Um, also, though, John Allegro did. He, he was better with the media. He was better at bringing the Dead Sea Scrolls to the public. And so he was able to launch a little bit of an expedition in pursuit of Copper Scroll treasure. As, as you've probably picked up, he wasn't necessarily a man of, you know, Olympian patience, though. So he didn't prove to kind of have the personality that you need for archaeology. So he did. He went to three different places. He went to um, some of the funerary shrines outside the old city walls in Jerusalem because he thought that some of the descriptions might point to the tomb of Absalom and, and those those um, that area, if anyone's familiar with Jerusalem. But there's very old graves all around um, on that sally- side of the, the valley in Jerusalem. He dug there, but really kind of gave up there early. He dug at Qumran, but really kind of used the metal detector at Qumran that wasn't that great because the soil there is mineralized. M- metal detectors didn't work that great in that kind of environment. And his best job was at this place called Hirkanya, which is... Um, south of Quran, it's not too far, but it was an unexcavated ruin, and he really was able to match up some of the details with with that particular site. It's kind of like Masada. It's a mountaintop fortress in the desert, and really sort of gave up there, too. <laughs> so, All right, we're going to, I'm going to jump in yeah, here. We'll take he another time. All right, we'll come back, and uh, we'll also uh, talk about the central uh, character in uh, the Copper Scroll Project, Jim Barfield, who is this uh, Indiana Jones character. We'll uh, do all of that. When we come back, uh, my conversation with Shelley Neese continues right here on The Conspiracy Show. 
curiosity or did the devil make you do it? Whatever the reason, welcome back to The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zoomer Radio. We're back with Shelley Nees, author of The Copper Scroll Project. Uh, so after Allegro sort of gives up, what happens to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the scroll? Right. Well, so I think for a lot of people or for a lot of archaeologists, the Copper Scroll occupies this tricky space because archaeologists don't take ancient text and use them as a method for for finding ruins, much less treasure. Um, you know, so there's a lot in Israel. This this will create a lot of stigma, even if you take the Bible necessarily and, you know, go try and dig up the Bible. That was done more in the 1800s or, you know, the early earliest phase of, of biblical archaeology in Israel. But now scholars really try to avoid that um, because, for one, it's always difficult to look with intention for something, you know, to you excavate an area and you excavate it to the last level of habitation. And if you find something great, but you don't necessarily go looking for something in particular, especially using an ancient text. And so, so the copper scroll, it, it, it offered a lot. It gave a lot of stigma, negative stigma to anyone who, who would try and do that. So John Allegro got a lot of um, negative feedback. <laughs> let's just say that for pursuing copper scroll treasure and using the copper scroll for what it was and trying to follow its verbal descriptions in terms of where to find treasure. And, and so because of that, you, we really don't see anyone else really do what he did as a professional or as a scholar and as, as an archaeologist. Now, many archaeologists have gotten a little bit of a bee in their bonnet about Copper Scroll, but they, and they've told me that privately, you know, that the Copper Scroll haunts them, that they'll wonder sometimes when they're excavating these places if it's connected to Copper Scroll treasure, but they never outwardly advertise that they you know, or in pursuit of copper scroll treasure. Right, right. So it eventually it is returned to Jordan? Right. So the copper scroll to this day sits in Jordan, in Amman, Jordan, cut into 23 pieces. There's been lots of translations of it. In general, most of the translations, because the, you know, handwriting is a little shoddy, because the words are squished together at different points, so it's hard to know when one word begins and one word ends. The translations do differ from each other a bit, but there's also a lot of agreement in each of the translations. And do you believe, Shelley, do you believe or maybe know for a fact that the the Copper Scroll could lead us to the location of the Ark of the Covenant? I believe that the Copper Scroll is a real and authentic document that points to Jerusalem temple treasure. I also know that nothing from the interior of the temple has ever been found. So that's one thing that really, you know, obviously the Jewish temple existed and, and any kind of temple denial um, is just based on something other than any kind of historical facts. So it's hard to use historical facts to fight, uh, you know, to fight myth. But it is important. It's an important part of the Palestinian sort of fight, and, and what they bring up a lot is the fact that nothing has ever been found from the interior of the Jewish temple, either the first temple or the second temple. It doesn't help that we can't dig on the Temple Mount. But what I'm trying to say is that anything, it is important if the Copper Scroll can lead to anything that is associated with the the rituals and the sacrificial systems that took place in the Jewish temple, because we don't have that. We've never been able to unearth that. And so even if one thing is found, it, it sort of rewrites that script. Right. But let me go further, though. If, I mean, mm -hmm. the Ark of the Covenant, I mean, contains awesome power, I happen to believe, mm -hmm. awesome power uh, to to destroy, to... Uh, you know, brought down the walls of Jericho. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, if this copper Killed scroll... scorpions and six yes, snakes in its wake. Yes. Giant scorpions. If this, right. if this map leads to the, the Ark of the Covenant, this, this would be the, the greatest discovery in history, never mind the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 20th century, in, in right. history. So 
That brings us to our uh, the the, uh, the hero of our story, Jim Barfield. We've got about a minute. To, uh, we head into a break, but just give me a, a quick summary of, of who Jim Barfield is. Sure. He is a retired arson investigator from Oklahoma. He self-deprecates and says that, you know, he doesn't have any letters behind his name other than being a certified fire truck driver. But I will say that that's nonsense. He's a very, very self-educated man and, and an internationally awarded arson investigator. And All right. He, when, we come, when we come back, we'll, um, we'll discuss how Jim Barfield uh, fits into this amazing mystery uh, detective story, The Copper Scroll Project with Shelley Neese. Stay tuned. The truth is not out there. It's right here. The Conspiracy Show with Richard Sarrett from Zoomer Radio. All right, Shelley, this is where the rubber hits the road. Jim Barfield, this arson investigator from Oklahoma City, retired. How did he become interested in the Copper Scroll treasure map? And uh, then we'll get into um, how he f figures, he or how he thinks he's figured out this mystery. Absolutely. So Jim Barfield is the kind of guy that was studying Dead Sea Scroll text and, and translations and when he was taking shifts at the fire department um, as a young fireman. I mean, he's just always been really interested in the Dead Sea Scrolls, always really drawn to them. And so the Copper Scroll was the least interesting of the Dead Sea Scrolls to him for for the most part because of all the things that we've said on the show. But really, one day after talking to a man named Vendel Jones, who is famously connected to the Copper Scroll and that he, he's passed away now, but he spent most of his life in search of Copper Scroll treasure. I haven't mentioned him because he's not an archaeologist. He's not an explorer or scholar. He was, you know, he was a rogue um, explorer. But Jim Barfield met him and he and he was intrigued by all of his Copper Scroll research. And so he sat, decided to just look at the Copper Scroll with new eyes. What he did that was different in terms of what anyone else had done when they tried to identify any recognizable parts of the Copper Scroll with something in Israel today, because the problem is, is the Copper Scroll is very specific. So when it says double entry pools or stairs facing eastward or courtyards or cisterns or peristyles, we just don't know if that was written 2,000 years ago, how in the world we would place it with anything today or anything that's still in existence. Because all those clues, uh, those visual markers are gone. They've turned to dust, perhaps. Totally. totally. It's just way too specific to be helpful, even, almost. Um, it, you know, it'd be like if someone found my grocery list in 2,000 years. And so, so this Copper Scroll opens up, though, and it says, in the ruin, which is in the Valley of Accor. And so what he did that it's not it's not declaring him a genius, but it's just, you know, sometimes the simplest answer is looking you right in the face. And so when he reads that first line, most Copper Scroll experts saw that as just related to the very first location and not to the 60 following. He read it and just immediately saw it as a preamble, as you know, what it's saying is in the ruin, which is in the Valley of Accor, everything that follows is buried. And so there's one obvious ruin that is in what's traditionally thought of as the Valley of Accor, and that's Qumran. There's other ruins, but Qumran's the most popular one. Qumran's the one that we associate with the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so he looked at an aerial map of Qumran and thought, well, I wonder if there's any architectural matches between, you know, what we see here described on the Copper Scroll and, and a map of Qumran. And so the very next line talks about stairs facing eastward that measure 40 cubits. So it's pretty easy to look at a map of Qumran and say, see that there are stairs facing eastward. He dug into the scholarship and to the publications from the most recent excavations at that time and found you know, did a little bit of a conversion, a mathematical conversion to find out how long those stairs were. But as it turns out, they're 19 meters. They're exactly 40 cubits. Oh, my. Um, oh, my. And so take that 
and just multiply it times 60. <laughs> and that's what he does. So you, when the Copper Scroll, my, one of my favorites is, is it describes a double entry pool with stairs facing to the left. And one of the most famous parts of Qumran is this one very peculiar mikvah, or this very peculiar ritual bath that has a double entry with stairs that go down and go to the left. It's at the northwest edge of the community. It's exactly as it's described in the Copper Scroll. So it's really just phenomenal. I mean, it's like the the descriptions in the Copper Scroll, once you're just focused on Qumran, I mean, it all leaps out at you from the page. And did he publish? Well, obviously, because you know about it. He, I mean, he... He's talked about this. So well, why isn't Qumran being excavated right now? Right. So he was able just, and this is, you know, part of, I've been writing this book for 10 years. So archaeology takes time. It takes bureaucracy. It takes patience, really Olympian patience. But the thing is, is he was, you know, sitting in his home in Lawton, Oklahoma. So how he got a meeting with the Antiquities Authority in Israel, um, that's a long story in itself, but it happens. And within really a year and a half from that point, from the first time that he is able to, to pinpoint a location on the Copper Scroll, he was able to excavate in Qumran um, with an archaeologist who since has died young in a tragic cave accident, but his name was Yuval Peleg. And he was the number two in command of Qumran. And so they picked four or five different test sites. I was actually there for this particular dig and um, to do probes in Qumran to see if the research does indeed, you know, point to Copper Scroll treasure. And by the way, Yuval Peleg, he had just finished publishing. Um, he was an archaeologist that had dug at Qumran for years and had determined that it was nothing more than an ancient pottery factory. So even the fact that he was open-minded enough and saw the research as as convincing enough to go against his own theory and beliefs in terms of Qumran's importance was impressive. But the problem was is that the Copper Scroll talks about digging at depths that are up to 12 feet, you know, add on to that 2,000 years of sand <laughs> and what has blown in. And so we're talking about sometimes digging 13, 14 feet. Um, and Qumran is a sacred site as it is to Israel. This is a precious site. So you would end up turning Qumran into like a up, you know, up close shot of the moon. I mean, you would just have craters all over. And, um, so the dig got stopped because of, of the damage that it could potentially cause to Qumran. And so for a long time, it was a period of waiting out the technology to be able to get a metal detector that would be able to to kind of tell us if there was something very deep, if it was ferrous or non-ferrous metals, what you know, what kind of metal it was and how large it was. Well, if, if we're talking about, let's be conservative, uh, I think mm -hmm. you said originally... Uh, in terms 160 of 150 tons. and then you cut it in half so let's say 75 tons of gold and silver uh, and that's not including the uh, the furniture uh, and the Ark of the Covenant or whatever whatever else or more altar. exactly or more scrolls we'd have to be talking about a large underground chamber would we not right and, and, right. and, and couldn't you use some sort of deep uh, ground penetrating sonar i mean they surely have that now to to find right, it which has been done and it has shown that cavities are underneath quran you know randall price um he's a archaeologist connected with liberty university he's done excavations on the plateau just right outside of quran and he has found cavities there there's other scholars who have contacted me even since the publication of this book and who, who have said we know of cavities there. Um, so there's definitely indication that there's cavities at Qumran, but all of that is technically Qumran is excavated to the last level of habitation. To dig and to create probes and to, to look for cavities, you know, it gets you in this, this dilemma that you see in archaeology all the time is do you destroy something precious for potentially what's underneath or do you let it lie? Do you keep it for some future excavation? I mean, this 
this sort of dilemma, you know, you see it with the terracotta warriors in China. The debate happens with King Tut's tomb in Egypt and potentially the void that's on the other side. So I've seen this flesh out in other parts of the world, but also, you know, with Qumran and the Bible attached to it and potential temple treasures, like it's more weighted and it, it seems um, it seems heavier. But I will say that we do have a metal detector now that can kind of do that job. And it's a long story, but a member of Israel's Knesset was able to do a scan at, five of the locations connected to the copper scroll it's called a lorenz metal detector if you know anything about metal detectors i mean it's kind of the top of the line it's a ten thousand dollar metal detector and at four of those five sites it scanned positive for non-ferrous metals so that means gold silver or bronze they adjusted the settings so that it would only tell if it was something very large and um if it was deep. So it would tell us if it was non-ferrous, if it was large, and if it was deep. And one of the sites in particular, four of the five scanned positive for, for that, which is something in and of itself. One of the sites, which is the one that I told you that's connected, that says, you know, Cavern of the Shekhinah, um, it, it looked like a reed of Fort Knox. Oh, it was my. something very large. Oh my! And gold, silver, or bronze, and very deep. Uh, this isn't just about you know treasure and of of uncalculable wealth. We're talking about geopolitical implications here as well. Is that Huge. possibly keeping uh, keeping a lid on this? For example, uh, you know, if they were to to verify that they were that this this could confirm the existence of not confirm we know that the first and second temple existed but mm-hmm. um for this to be publicly confirmed um i mean is it is it thought that this could scuttle any potential future peace deal or i mean what's what's keeping a lid on this aside from just well we don't want to disrupt uh this holy site right well absolutely it's area c like we talked about earlier so technically whatever comes out of the ground there let's say it is the ark of the covenant or the breastplate of righteousness there's a part of the copper scroll that says my priestly vestment it uses the possessive yud at the end of priestly vestment so indicating that whoever wrote this might have been a priest himself and he had his own priestly vestment so let's say it's any of that whatever comes out of the qumran technically by international law is disputed property so you can bet that if whatever it is, that it will be claimed by Jordan, that it will be claimed by Palestinians. Even today, anywhere the Dead Sea Scrolls are being exhibited, whether or not that's in Denver or San Diego, there will be protesters there saying that these are not the under the propriety of Israel, that they are illegally owning these, never mind the fact that they're Jewish texts written in Hebrew by Jewish authors. So, you know, I if Israel is keeping the lid on it because, you know, waiting for some future time that it would be less controversial, I mean, I can't I can't say that I don't understand that. Um, it's hard to imagine because it's hard to stop progress and it's hard to put smoke back in a bottle. But at least that's my hope is just by making a groundswell of information. And I've really, we've known about this scan. I've withheld this information for a long time, just seeing if things could happen naturally and organically through the right channels and systems. But it's, it's, it's proven to, you know, not be able to overcome the, the geopolitics. And so that's what I'm hoping is just this groundswell of information. And I'm, we're seeing that happen in Israel as Israelis are finding this story out. Um, that not, not to create like rage, but just to create a pressing need that no, this is actually worth the test. And this one particular site will not damage Qumran. So we've really zoned in all of our efforts on even just testing this one site where we have a uber positive scan and is not threatening to the Qumran ruins itself. You know, when something comes out of the ground there, then we'll move on to, to Qumran proper and maybe every the, well, it'll tilt the scales in that way. This is potentially uh, just, you know, I can't even under, or overstate the enormity of this. The Copper Scroll Project, an ancient secret fuels the battle 
for the Temple Mount. Shelly, thank you so much for hanging out for the last two hours. This has been uh, exciting you. and enlightening. Thank you so much, Richard. My pleasure. Shelly Nice. Okay, once again, wishing you all the merriest of Christmases. Back next week with Ghosts of World War II with author Matt Swain. In the meantime, don't be afraid. There is nothing concealed that won't be revealed and nothing hidden that won't be made known. What you hear in the dark, speak in the light. What I say in a whisper, proclaim from the housetops. Move over, Aphrodite. I'm coming home. Good night and God bless.